here today. Uh, Leona McIntyre is a member of the Red River Métis Nation of Manitoba. She's of Ojibwe, Cree, Scottish, and Irish descent. She's currently employed with economic development, investment, and trade with the province of Manitoba. She works in the Economic, Labour, and Market Policy Division as part of the Stakeholder Relations and Communications Team. Her role with the province is to help design and develop projects, workshops, and training opportunities with Indigenous communities in Manitoba and her fellow colleagues. These projects are developed around many in initiatives such as food sovereignty, entrepreneurship, and cultural slash ecotourism, to name a few. Leona has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Native Studies and Sociology from Brandon University. She's a registered professional trainer with the Indigenous Leadership Development Institute, an Indigenous owned and operated business that has built a business around being by Indigenous for Indigenous. Leona enjoys learning and teaching and loves to share the beauty of her culture. She's an artist with artwork all over the world and is a published photographer. She's operated a small to medium sized business for the last 15 years and is currently in the process of expanding it or after her pending retirement, which is to be announced. Leona. Thank you very much, Emmett. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. And uh, I am uh, coming to you virtually today on the west shores of Lake Manitoba in a little Métis community called Kenesota. So uh, look it up on your map and uh, um, enjoy the scene. So I have the honor and the privilege of introducing Elder Brian McLeod. And uh, just to let you know, Brian McLeod is from Treaty 5, which is Grand Rapids, and that is the Misopoistic Cree Nation. Brian recently worked at Stony Mountain Penitentiary for 10 and a half years as an elder providing Indigenous cultural support to Indigenous and non-Indigenous inmates. Brian now works as the elder slash knowledge keeper for Native Clan Manitou House. Brian shares his knowledge and experience to help build good relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. Some of his other previous works include being a cultural teacher with Red River College, CEO with Strongheart Teaching Lodge, culture advisor with Winnipeg School Division, and being a training workshop and presentation facilitator for a host of organizations through his company, Strongheart Consultation. Some of his current work in this regard includes the RCMP, Indigenous Perception and Current current events, Manitoba Hydro, City of Winnipeg, Ubisoft Winnipeg, uh, cultural awareness and residential school information, Indigenous timelines, cultural competency, and worldviews. Brian enjoys sharing culture, ceremonies, and teachings, and fact-based knowledge of the Indigenous and non-Indigenous relationships in Canada. He is a knowledge keeper of the pipe, sweat lodge bundle carrier and has been walking the Sundance Trail for 30 years. Brian believes in the sacred ways of his ancestors and sacred relationship to all living things as a pathway to truth and reconciliation. Brian, thank you so much for doing this with us today. And with that, I welcome you and everyone. Here's Elder Brian McLeod. Jimmy miigwech. miigwech. Thank you. Uh, I'm very uh, grateful to be here today and to uh, do the opening prayer and to acknowledge life in that sacred way. And uh, I'll do a little bit of the prayer in my language and then continue on English so that everyone can understand a bit of what I'm praying for. Today I used the uh, eagle fan of my, my daughter, who we just did uh, driving lessons with. And uh, it, it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you do a lot of praying when you're doing driving lessons with your child. <laughs> 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 oh, but it's wonderful. It's so wonderful to see your kids grow and become young, independent uh, adults moving into this world. And I'm hoping that's something that we all can look forward to, to see our future generations grow and, and learn and to be those strong, uh, productive, loving, kind people in our life. Um, Grandfathers, grandmothers, we ask that you guide us all here today. We welcome in the spirit of all living things and all life and our understandings of life. We are grateful for the time we get together here today to discuss ideas and look at ways to move forward in this good life. 
Help us to understand the relationship of all living things as being related to one another, wakotuin and watastuin, to live together in good ways. We hope that uh, what we do here today provides a good trail for future generations and acknowledgement of all the possibilities that we can achieve working together as a family, as uh, relatives to one another. I go say, amigoch. I, I know, I know, unmute, I know. <laughs> Two years of doing this, you'd think I'd catch on, right? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I have to Not make alone. it difficult. It just <laughs> Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I also have the privilege and the honor of introducing the panelists. And um, so I'd like to start with that first. And I would like to introduce Derek Bobby. Bachelor of Science and a ba oh, oh, B A C O oh, O oh, Bobby I Paul Derek I mean I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. I, Don't even worry about that. One. Okay, okay, but you'll tell us, right? Good. So sure, yeah. Derek has over. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Derek has over twenty years working as a conservation officer for the government of Manitoba. Through his work for the government, he has had the opportunity to work with a variety of staff, agencies, government departments, and the general public. Key accomplishments include completing the Indigenous Relations Certificate Program, serving as a board member and treasurer of the North American Wildlife Enforcement Memorial and Educational Center, NAWAMEC, and was a part of a working group for the Shared Management Deputy Minister Delivery Team. Derek has presented numerous educational talks to schools, organizations, and local media. And that's Derek, Bobby. Next, we have Frankie Snyder. And Frankie is a Métis woman, woman from the Red River Settlement located near Selkirk, where she was born and raised. She began her career as a mental health clinician, where she worked in a crisis setting prior to moving on to policy analysis and then leadership roles with health, justice, and most currently is serving as the Assistant Deputy Minister of Indigenous Reconciliation and Northern Relations. Frankie's work, whether in leadership or the front line, has centered around advancing collaborative approaches, advancing reconciliation, and improvement in access to quality services to Indigenous communities. Thank you and welcome, Jackie. Next, we have panelist Janelle Smith. She is a she is Canadian-born multicultural Ottawa and descending from Italian and French heritage. Having been brought up in government regulated child welfare systems herself, she has dedicated a significant portion of her early life to fighting for improved quality of services throughout these systems, as well as physiological welfare and justice systems. Janelle made the transition into working with the federal government in the correctional field when she moved to Manitoba. Her career and personal focus are now in ensuring the continuous and prog progressive work being done to move our communities into a new vision for how we help those heal after trauma and incarceration. As the director of Manitou House, the community correctional healing facility operated by the Native Clan organization, Janelle experiences firsthand the significant need for advocacy and the fight for progression of Indigenous ways of justice. The Native Clan organization is an Indigenous nonprofit that takes a culturally and trauma informed approach to creating individual and tailored healing plans with their relatives who are the clients, who are reintegrating back to their communities or starting new lives after contact with the justice system. Welcome, Janelle. And next we have Darren Ramsey. And I know Darren. Hi, Darren. Darren has been working <laughs> for the provincial government for the past 22 years in a number of Indigenous portfolio policy areas. Currently, Darren is with Manitoba Health. Darren has also worked within Indigenous service delivery agencies prior to government. And Darren is a band member of the Little Saskatchewan First Nation. Welcome to all our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just to get right into it, does anybody have a comment or anything before I ask the first question? Nothing yet? Okay, I'm going to jump right into it. Thank you all again. So, um, when we look at uh, what we're doing today around reconciliation, thinking of your recent past work, what does truth and reconciliation look like for you right now? And I'll just begin with um, the way I introduced you folks. If you don't mind, I'll 
ask Derek and then Frankie, then I'll go to Janelle and then Darren, if that's fine with all of you. I was kind of hoping somebody else would go first. So I know I'm on the right track, but uh, that's all right. <laughs> we're always on the right track, Derek. Thank you. Um, yeah. So reconciliation now for me is, I guess we're trying to come together as two groups, but I, I think we're just starting with, We've been discussing the topic. It's been on the media for several years, and we're actually finally starting, I feel, to get some motion going. So um, I think people are starting to, to get educated. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I think. Excellent. Thank you, Derek. And uh, Janelle, or no, Frankie, I believe you were next. Yeah, so I uh, I usually answer this question with a very long story, <laughs> which I hope my fellow panelists, I have a tendency to do, but I'll abbreviate it. You have five it. minutes. <laughs> just kidding. Just, just 25, kidding, Frankie. 25, Luna? Um, a, a five? <laughs> okay. So reconciliation for me started long, long, long before um, there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and it started for me with a... a interaction with uh, a community, La Roche, where there was a number of um, youth suicides that were happening in the community. And my colleagues at Health approached me asking, um, how, how come we keep trying to go into this community and, and we're being asked to leave? And so I had the blessing of um, sitting with a group of traditional healers. And in fact, Darren, you might have actually been at that now that I'm thinking about it and looking at your face. It was a long time ago. I won't age us. Um, but I asked the elder and said, uh, you know, can you can you help me understand? As a mental health clinician, there are people who really want to help. I don't understand. And he looked at me and, and said, quite simply, you didn't ask. You didn't ask. And that, is, uh, that has been a, a story and a teaching that I have carried with me from that day forward. Um, so that was a very abbreviated version of that story, but, it, but I carry it with me and I encourage each of you to carry it with you as well. And so now fast forwarding some 20 years or so, um, it, it looks like collaboration to me. It looks like systemic shifts. We cannot have an, a solution to systemic racism if we don't have systemic responses to that. Um, it's easy to do and it's so easy not to do. It's easy to get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives and forget to ask who's not at the table or get caught up with the rush urgent or super rush. I've learned since landing in IRNR that there's a lot of super rushes. Um, for whatever that means, but it's it's easy to, to forget to ask who's not at the table and to ask community and ask the people that are affected by the decisions you're making. It's about pausing for me, um, taking a moment, which I, I know those who know me on this call know I don't do well, um, but taking a moment to pause and think about what we're doing and stop legislation that looks like it's going to have a negative impact and have the brave conversations. And uh, for those that know me, uh, know that I believe wholeheartedly it's about disrupting. So much so that, uh, that some of my colleagues named a band Frankie and the Disruptors because at every meeting I'm apologizing for being a disruptor. But we have to have those brave conversations and be courageous and say, you know, I think, you know, minister or colleague or whoever that this is, this is, this is something we need to stop or we need to do differently or we need to look at from a different angle or perhaps somebody's not in the room. And so I'll, I'll pass that on, I think under five minutes. Absolutely wonderful, Frankie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Janelle. Thank you. Um, so reconciliation for myself in the work that I have done and where we are right now, I feel like we have a lot of great plans on paper, um, but I feel like we haven't made any strategy to really implement them where it counts. Um, you know, with the relatives and the individuals I work with today and being in community in the heart of you know, really feeling what everybody is going through. I hear so often now that reconciliation is dead. That has to affect you. 
in one way or another. Um, and if our youth, if that's how they feel, if, you know, our men and our women feel like nothing is being done to really truly reconcile the wrongdoings, how, how are we supposed to create this new vision, this new world where we truly honor each other and love each other and see each other for who we really are. So, I mean, in my day to day now, I, I really try and strive and fight to be more um, positive and really focus on the, the wonderful small changes I see. However, in my professional development, when I need to go to bat for these things, it's unfortunately still a lot of negative that I'm forced to really vocalize. Um, so for me right now, I feel like it's on the table. We really, people want to get there, but there's not enough truth that's been acknowledged. There's not enough headway for anyone to really feel like this is a priority. You know, it's really easy to have fireworks at the forks and celebrate indigenous people's day but what about the people that are suffering that are not there right so that's how i feel <laughs> yes thank you very much janelle and darren oh thank you leona um first off i just want to start off with honoring the presence of our elder brian mcleod um i've known brian for a little while we've We've had the I've had the privilege of working with him in the past on um, what, uh, as you said, uh, Leona, in in the little brief bio on myself that I forwarded. Um, there's been a number of areas that I've worked in uh, Indigenous portfolio policy areas, and I know in the past Brian and I had got to spend some time together working on. Uh, on with the three levels of government and the uh, urban indigenous community and that was very exciting times because it was the um it it uh, it seemed like there was some an like a certain kind of energy uh coming out of that work and so with that i'm going to sort of use that as my um, a segue into into the question what reconciliation means to me is um because I'm also a little bit like Frankie, I have to kind of monitor myself because I can go in and out of several doors, you know, from the emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical about it. Uh, and and sometimes I think we need to say, we all need to say, think, and share about from a very, you know, sort of pra pragmatic uh, mental perspective, if you want to say it that way. And sometimes it, it needs the emotional and the spiritual and the physical presence. But so where I'll just try to uh, start from again here is I recall a number of years ago after the RCAP, Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples report had come out and I was in one of the first, then they call it Aboriginal studies, I think, or something, courses that was um, uh, being delivered by Wanda Watney at the University of Manitoba. And we had Phil Fontaine come in at the time and do a, a, a keynote on, and talk about RCAP. And I remember feeling a little bit of a, a sort of an energy there about it too, a vibe, if you will, um, uh, for many reasons, personal, because, you know, being, uh, being who I am, where I come from and why I was why I chose to go to university and why I chose to go into the particular studies that I was. And then, so our cap, you know, came and gone and it sort of, I, I like to think it has more of a, uh, a uh, it had more of a, an impact than I'm probably going to give the, you know, slight definition on it right now. Sometimes I think it sits somewhere on a shelf right now and it's kind of one of those important pieces of work that took place in the past, but yet still has some kind of impact on the future. And so now when we fast forward to, to uh, truth and reconciliation and reconciliation and what that means, it's, um, I feel there's a really, it's almost like, I don't even know if I'm using the term properly, but a real res re renaissance in that sense of, of why we need to look at these issues and related to them and why we need to collaborate, why we need to meet um, not only with governments and leadership and First Nation communities and Indigenous communities, but just community in general, I, I think that's very, very important because I remember there was a, 
bureaucrat I used to work with for a number of years. He's now retired and moved on. But he used to have this saying, the train has left the station. And I think the train has left the station on this one. You know, like it's it's one of those things that you just you you can't um, you can't do anything with it but go forward. And I think for the most part, we all have a, a really good place in our, you know, in our four elements of our being, like in our in our in our heads and our mental and our hearts and our spiritual and our body, how we want to collaborate and, and move forward on reconciliation. But it's not easy because human beings are creatures of this world, of this world we live in right now, this experience we're having. And, and as you all know, if you want to get down, go down the rabbit hole about it or get into the weeds about it, which five minutes doesn't provide, humans are complex creatures in the way they think, act and feel and interact with each other. So reconciliation, I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful. I have much to say about it. Um, you know, I... I just very quickly in our family, we still feel the intergenerational impacts of my grandmother spending almost 18 years of her life in residential school. And I'm a 60 scoop survivor along with three other siblings in my family. So there is some personal perspective and investment there on my part. But really what I've come to learn over the years is that it takes it's way better going the road on things like this, you know, with others than it is on your own. So I'll just stop with that for now. Wow, thank you very much, Darren. I sure appreciate that. Uh, I, I love what you all said. I, I just want to um, share, just recap, because I think it's important. And these are just, I, as the moderator, I just want to show you what I got out of, you know, like, I, I like that learning to keep trying, Derek, how you had said, you know, we all got to keep trying, keep learning, because that's very important. And, you know, and, and, just, uh, um, you know, Frankie, I, I was just on a call this morning. And that's one of the things I said about, we have to have the right people there. Who are we gonna, you know, who are the people we're talking to have the right people and, and you have to do the investigation in the sense of are they the right people ask the questions, you know, and when we look at, um, you know, what's being done now, Janelle, you said, you know, it's those small changes. Like I remember a long time ago, they had that commercial on TV, you know, it's not the big Eureka's it's those little small Eureka's that make the big Eureka's, you know, and that's what I'm thinking of how we're doing on our, our, our trip forward. And, and Darren, like you nailed it for me, like the energy, the good energy, you know, the, 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 the emotional, physical, mental, spiritual, I mean, that's what we're all feeling. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much. I'm just going to jump into the next question. And if anyone would like to add after, please do. So um, when we, when we talk about truth and reconciliation, what uh, uh, practically does that like practically, does that mean for your say day to day work? And I know Janelle, you you started on something like your day to day work, but when you go to the office in the morning, how how does that work for you? And um, I think I'm going to um, actually jump in with Janelle because uh, um, that's one of the things you mentioned about your day to day, and I'd like to follow up with that. So Janelle, great, thank you. So day to day working at Manitou House, we honestly strive to create this environment where all of the staff, the entire team, all of our residents arriving here, and even community members now that we're, you know, COVID has kind of ended and we're opening our doors back up to anybody that needs support. We really want this safe and holistic environment where they feel like whether they understand who they are, they have the ability to start asking those questions. They have the ability to start their day off with a smudge to have a wonderful room that feels good when you walk in, you know, to have staff tell you that, you know, just to be able to come here and to feel good about what I'm doing and to have people smile and to have people, you know, a lot of the staff that do come in, they're very, we all have trauma that we've experienced, right? So it's for them to be able to utilize the very basic foundation of some of the skills that Elder Brian has provided, our executive director Kendall Joyner has provided. It really, it really lets everybody be able to connect in such a good way. So we just we tr we truly focus on making sure those very small, you know, um, contributions to safe environment, you know, good energy around, like you guys have all said, 
um, the ability to go out onto our sacred grounds and to pray, to have ceremony with Elder Brian, those are all readily and available at the very basics. So those are some of the things that we do day to day to ensure that we start our day off on a good foot. You know, we can't, we can't fight the fight if we're not really, truly walking in those shoes. So... Indeed. Oh, thank you very mm -hmm. much, Janelle. Derek, I'm going to jump to you if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, I guess for me, how, how to, when I talked about reconciliation, I think it was Janelle who said that we have all these great plans and, and it's about putting them into motion. And I, I think for me, uh, I, I still work for the government. What I need to do is I have to keep that topic going. I can't just shelf it like every, like, well, like I've always done. And I know for me, I, I, I mean, don't have any Indigenous people that work with me, but I think I need to be the person that constantly is bringing up that topic, saying this has to be included in our day-to-day -day decisions and constantly talk about how we can help reconcil reconciliation happen. And, and, and I think the big word in, in reconciliation is the word truth, too. I mean, um, when we start talking about some of the berries, I'll get to that, but I think that's very important that we keep the truth and the openness there. But yeah, for me, practically, it's a matter of constantly finding a way to make sure we're including Indigenous people in the decisions we make. How we do it, I don't know, but it's something that has to be done. So that's that's the, my goal going forward to practically to make sure I'm including the Indigenous community in what, what we do, because uh, I don't think we've been doing enough of it. Excellent. Thank you, Derek. I think what I heard was that you want a uh, strategy planner to help you with your inclusion strategy. <laughs> just, just kidding. But, yes, uh, but you know, sometimes we look at steps like that, you know, so yeah. Okay. Well, that's perfect. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Darren, I'm going to I jump to you and we'll leave Frankie for last uh, on this question. But if you could share with your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so um i um i have the privilege of working with a very uh small quaint but uh as we like to describe ourselves at times little powerhouse of um policy area i guess i would call it uh, a branch called intergovernmental and indigenous relations uh, uh in, in a division at manitoba health and um when i first came over, which was about, I think it's almost been two years there now. Um, I, I came over because I wanted to do different work and I wanted to, I've never worked in health before. And I, um, I wanted to try something new. And so there was a lot of, you know, hitting the ground learning and, and, and so on uh, about health sector and, and what the department does. And, and then and then finding out how I could contribute and find the areas I could work in, you know, in discussions with my manager and so on. But it all just kind of naturally fell into place. And sometimes it's really, it makes sense. And sometimes it's really awkward. Like, I'm going to try to speak truth, but not at the same time. I don't want to speak like I'm criticizing but sometimes you have to speak truths because we all work within, especially in government, within systems. We know that when something like reconciliation comes into the fold of that, what you're of what you're trying to do or what you were doing, that it's 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 I think we're just, you know, just getting our toes in there now and we're 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 taking a step backwards and going, oh why didn't we consider that first? Or now we have to we all have to educate ourselves about this and that and that. How do we do that? Who do we talk to? It's those kinds of things. So what I said or a minute ago was I guess I was fortunate that um and I still uh, I'm able to you know work with my manager and my team in a number of ways where I'll use my experience uh and uh but it's surprising you know and i think most folks know that that we're we're um some things about indigenous communities that we're uh in government is still needing and wanting to understand more about 
And did reconciliation all of a sudden just flip that, you know, right over and say, okay, now we got to do a whole new reset. I'm not so sure, but I, I mean, I'm glad it's, it's there and happening under that uh, banner, if you will. Um, uh, but it's some days it's, it's more challenging than other days. Uh, I mean, on a personal level, I, I, you know, I, I, what, what is that one character in galaxy? Quest said, Tim Allen, <laughs> never surrender or whatever. <laughs> I'm a big sci-fi guy. What can I say? But, um, you know, you, you just have to keep, uh, you, you create the, you look for the allies too, right? Because, and maybe that's a bit of a, a strong word for some, I don't know. But if you look for the people who are going to work with you, support you and vice versa, you know, I think the, the reality of finding ways to make either new discoveries or support to move reconciliation along in the work you do in your day-to-day -day life uh, in government, it, it, it'll be a lot easier for sure. And I was a little nervous when I came over to health because it's a large department and I thought it was just gonna be filled with a bunch of like highbrow people, you know, who are very, you know, speaking really high government code and and I'm not that kind of I'm not that kind of person. I really not I'm not. I mean I can articulate myself well enough, but I'm just not a real I'm not a I'm not like that. So that was a false perception of mine because I've met a lot of professionals who really want to understand, who want to work with you, who want to know more. And if they feel they comfortable enough to ask you, meaning me, what is it about this certain aspect that might I'm, I might I might might not be getting or I want to know more about how do I do that? Sometimes we have to discover that answer together too. It's not just solely up to me, right? So yeah, I'll just and I'll just end with that. Awesome, great, thank you. And and sadly, I knew what your reference to Galaxy Quest was. <laughs> my my thoughts awesome. are usually this. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, Star Trek and, you know, the Borg resistance is futile, what I always say, too, so things like that. But, yeah, thank you so much, and uh, thank you after sharing that. So, Frankie, um, you're next. <laughs> well, Darren, maybe not the galaxy, but I will introduce you to my friend Juan Pablo, the stormtrooper. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Professional life. Um, oh. Okay, so uh, I already started some of this uh, ground laying in the, in the first question, but practically ask, ask often, ask as much as possible, ask questions that are hard, ask questions that you feel are stupid, ask, just mm. ask, should I offer tobacco? How do I offer tobacco? How mm. should I start this meeting? What are the pro appropriate protocols if I'm inviting a grand chief? How do I brief my minister? How do I brief my colleagues, right? Like ask, ask as many questions and then get out and ask the people who are working in the front line, who are, who are leading the rights holder organizations, get out and ask. Um, ensure that you're always asking who's not being heard from. Um, I'm a big advocate. Um, many of my colleagues know this um, within including trans views and, and queer views around tables because we do a, a really kind of not so great job of, of always making sure those voices are heard. Um, and, and be aware that, you know, pan-Indigenous responses, even from um, sort of the global Métis or, or, right, like that's, I'm not going to be able to speak for a Métis person who lives in the North. I'm certainly not going to be able to speak from a Métis trans perspective. I'm certain, right? Like we need to, to remember that there is diversity amongst Indigenous people, that it's not limited to our um, distinction-based approaches either. Um, practically, we need to, within our civil service or public service now, ensure we have cascading governance structures. And so we've been building those into d separate departments, but making sure that we build in the structures to ask um, the political leaders of organizations to ask elders, ensure we have access to elders within our day-to-day -day work as early in the process as possible and shift our traditional bureaucratic ways of, of doing business. And so one example, 
I'd like to highlight for you folks uh, was, was with our IIU legislation when I was still working with justice. So the independent investigation unit, as many of you will know, goes out and does, does um, an analysis of what went wrong in a, in a police shooting or a police involved harm. And uh, we had a meeting very quickly after uh, the Aisha Hudson uh, finding was released. And that meeting went really poorly because we came as government, not myself, of course, no, just kidding. <laughs> we came as government and we did the same thing we always did. We said, here, we have these wonderful ideas about this legislation. And now Grand Chiefs, we'd like to, to, to have your sign off that we're on the right job. And, and of course, that's not what my colleagues meant. And of course, that's not where our hearts were, right? But it was, it was the wrong approach because we had jumped ahead of the conversation and what we needed to have done was taken it 10 steps back and had the conversation around, okay, so, so that inquest was, or that, that analysis is what it was and that finding is what it was, but that's not the end of the conversation, now what? And so that now what conversation is one we've actually started to have with the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and MKO and SCO and the MMF, and it has been incredible. And they helped us co-write legislation that is going to improve the IIU on a go-forward basis and really change the way that that, that that service works. And funny thing, they had all the solutions in a drawer and all we had to do was ask. So, so yeah, and then finally, just get out there and experience, experience the world. Elder, are you going to bang and tell me, whistle? Okay, I'm <laughs> done, I promise. No, I was just, I uh, just wanted to add something if it be okay. Yes, yes, please do. I think that uh, like many of us here, we've been working on reconciliation well before reconciliation became the media buzzword and um, mm -hmm. talk about truth. It occurs to me that many of us have been lobbying for many, many years about trying to have an equal footing on consultation and developing good work to be implemented in our various communities. And I think sometimes uh, to find truth and find a way forward, you have to have a common focus. And part of that, I think about like in 2019, where the BC provincial government implemented UNDRIP into their work, the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous People. And I'm wondering why we're not doing the same here in Manitoba, and why we're not acting on like Bill 18 and developing those strategies that are needed for all of us to have a framework on which to do the work. Um, because I know when I look at uh, reconciliation, I see reconciliation when I hear someone talking about Indigenous issues in school and my children are no longer hanging their heads down in shame or adults. They're lifting their heads up because they are well informed about the issues and can share the truth and have that from a place of empowerment. So that all the work that's being talked about here is, is coming from the grassroots and from the top. You know, So just something I want to add which seem to make a lot of sense with what everyone's been discussing here. Miigwech. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Elder McLeod. That makes so much sense to have focus. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, and Frankie, I got to tell you, I was just talking today about that exact same thing. Ask, ask often, ask lots, be loud, ask, ask, you know, and, and be inclusive. You, you know, it's just so important. And, you know, Darren, you, you know, I know how many different work, uh, sessions you've done in the sense of different departments in that because I think I've been following you I'm not sure but um, it is right to speak the truth uh, exactly it's it, it, I mean it's all about truth and reconciliation the truth is so important and uh, when Derek kept when Darren says we just keep on going and I'm thinking well exactly I mean one foot in step in front of the other like you know keep on moving keep doing it uh, you know and uh, Jen, when you spoke environment to me, that just, that's all that I agree, you know, Janelle about uh, being safe, 
and 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 hopeful and and holistic and open what else can you do you know but provide that safe place so um thank you all very much and i'm really glad you jumped in elder mcleod because it's always nice to have that uh that rounding uh effect of our questions so thank you and please jump in again if you'd like to add i much appreciate it and so um, we'll just go on to the next question. And um, some of you almost uh, uh, a little bit touched on it around the barriers to truth and reconciliation for you, because sometimes in our roles, we have those barriers and sometimes they're different for other people. So, so what are the barriers to truth and reconciliation for you? And I think I'll start with Darren this time, please. And thank you. Oh boy. So you wanna you wanna open a can of worms and go down a <laughs> rabbit hole, do you? <laughs> yeah. That's um, why I started with you and not Frankie. <laughs> just okay. Kidding, Frankie. So you know, just you know, I, I, just I, kidding. I think like I said in, in my earlier comments, I think it's very important to speak the truth, but with respect. Um I you know, as a as an indigenous person. Um, working in government for, you know, over 20 years now, uh, you know, I, I'm going to be very frank and honest. I've seen and experienced firsthand a lot of things that just blew my mind. And uh, um, that would go from microaggressive to downright racist, you know, and um, it, so the reason I, I, I reference that kind of dynamic is because it would be easy for me, especially in my past in another life, to really, you know, sort of rebuttal or challenge that in a not so productive way, in a not so, you know, positive manner. Uh, and um, I would speak truth to power in different ways. Um, now, in spite of, you know, everyday life is a challenge sometimes depending where you are in your path in life and in your, in our work lives, that is to me is always, it's something that I, I, I try to process every day while I'm still, you know, working and everything. And uh, when I think about things like reconciliation and how, um, what are the barriers? What are the things that I can do to make that create those safe spaces for myself and others when we're talking about these things? You know, that's where I try to 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 come at it from. I want to be able to say what's truth, but I don't want to offend or disrespect anyone or make them uncomfortable because you're not really going to open that doorway for them to come in and speak their own truth. And especially if it's something of that that they don't quite understand or get. And I was really still to this day surprised how many people that have been government in a long, long time. And they're almost, you know, for lack of a better word, timid to ask a certain question about reconciliation. And in even some of the things that were mentioned earlier about, you know, what are the protocols around engagement with, you know, with uh, or indigenous leadership and so on. It's a little surprising, but at the same time, I guess it's kind of understandable because we're, like I said, we're still just getting our toes into it, I think. We're not in, come on, folks, we're not in the middle of this going, oh, yeah, we're, you know, we're right, in, we're, we're making huge progress. We're just, I think we're just, you know, looking at it right now, and uh, we're trying to figure out almost the... Um, best practices, rules of engagement, protocols. I hate putting those kind of titles on it because I'm not that kind of, really that kind of person. I'm, I'm a little bit more fluid than that, I think. Um, so I try to create that safe space for not only myself, but others, and try to say it in a way that people are gonna understand and resonate with. Because when you're in a government meeting with a bunch of executives, and they have a certain way of communicating with each other. I'm not saying they're not human. Believe me, I'm not saying that, okay? But you have to meet them on their ground and bring your gifts and receive their gifts as well, right? So that's kind of where I try to approach it from. I know some of it sounds a little fluffy, maybe even a little corny, but hey, that's the way I fly, folks. And that's the way it seems to be working so far. Um, and uh, Barriers, 
is a very strong word because I, when I hear that word, I right away, I, I, I think of a, a teaching in one of the ceremonies I attended a number of years ago, the wolf teaching. And for those of you who have, uh, have had the uh, experience of the wolf teaching, there's a, there's a very powerful message in that. And that's when I think about barriers too. And those barriers can be, um, we have to overcome those barriers and we have to find those ways to make those barriers be overcome. Allow myself to introduce myself, said Austin Powers. You, if you know what I mean, we have to, we have to just find those ways to exist within getting to the, to the, to the place, right? Where the barriers, they still may exist there, but we may have hopped the fence now. You know what I mean? And wow, look where we are now. So yeah, I think I'll just stop there because I don't want to take up any more time. But uh, yeah, really good questions. But wow, do they ever evoke a lot in, in myself? Anyways, I, I just, I wish I had 12 hours to answer that question. Anyways, sorry, go ahead. Right on. Thanks, Darren. And and um, if anybody wants to connect with Darren, you know how to find him on his government email. <laughs> because you're right, Darren, we could go on and on. And and, and we do only have a time limit. Uh, uh, Derek, um, would you mind sharing with you with us uh, your thoughts? Sure. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that when I was looking at all the things we we're going to talk about today, this is the one that I had the most information on, uh, which to me shows how difficult this is, but I think one of the biggest barriers I found is I'm so afraid to say something that's gonna, gonna offend someone, but the government also is afraid of what we're gonna say we're, when we're in certain places because they're afraid it's gonna be used against them. And sometimes it's you can't be truthful and honest because you're so worried about getting into trouble like that's been my biggest thing is if i say this is the government gonna be mad at me because i shouldn't have said it and uh i find it very tough to 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 be in communities when you have to be afraid of what you say and so what do you do you avoid the situations because it's the best way to not say something and get in trouble and so that's been one of my my biggest thing and, and of course the distrust between Indigenous communities and, and, and say myself, it's, that's been beaten into us over centuries and, and it's a really tough thing for everyone to overcome. And so, you know, how do we, how do we break down those defenses of everyone? But the biggest thing I wish is that the government would be a little more open to let us be honest when we're in a community. Um, you know, I, I find that's, that's a tough one because if you're not being honest, like we talked before, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, I have a bunch of other things written down here, sorry. Um, kind of education. Like I know for me, you know, Rebecca McKay is the one that comes to mind, but they did a program in our department, SERP there, that Indigenous Relations. And, you know, for 20 years of my life, I, I don't think I'm a racist in any way. And it wasn't until I took that course that I got to see how, and I still hate using the word racist, but I was doing things that I didn't even know I was doing that were, were would cause people to to think I'm a racist and I think more people need to realize that when we call or say there's some biases in that that it's not a, a criticism against the personality that's you just don't know what we're doing to be non-inclusive with with indigenous communities I had no idea and it, it comes back to what Frankie's story I, I was in Grand Rapids um, working and and uh, there was an issue with the resource and I came up with this great solution and I went to the chief saying, Hey, look what I, you know, I have this idea how we can help the community. And the individual was Ovid Meckard. He said, you know, Derek, that's a, a white man solution to white man problem. And I was so offended mm -hmm. because I, here I am trying to do such a good thing. And it took me, it took me 15 years to finally realize the problem wasn't necessarily my, my solution might've been good. It was that I never asked them if there was a problem for them to start. And number two, I never asked if they had a solution to that issue that I thought I was so great at solving. So when, when I say I don't realize I was being racist, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I had no clue that I was being non-inclusive until someone pointed out to me that sometimes we're doing things because that's just what we've been taught to do and we don't even know it. 
So I always thought I was such a good person because I, I was friends with everyone and have Indigenous friends, but I, I've never taken the time to really get the background of what people went through to see who, how they were made the way they are, you know? And uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's just two of the barriers. I won't go any further because uh, I could be very negative and I could really beat down, beat down the government. But um, yeah, I, I wish more people could take the course I took so that we can meet some really great indigenous people that do take the time to teach us and, and tell us what you guys have been saying, ask questions. You're not going to offend anyone if you ask me about whatever, because, because we're afraid. Like I'm, I was afraid as government worker to do that for fear of, of getting in trouble at work. I can't afford to lose my job. So that was always a fear. Anyways, sorry. Derek, thank you so much for your honesty and uh, sharing that with us. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, yeah. you're right about uh, educate uh, us as Indigenous people sharing our education, uh, our traditions, uh, you know, with our colleagues. Uh, I'm going to blatantly promote the Connect article, Indigenous Speaks, and now I'm going to quit. And I'm going to go to Frankie, please. <laughs> that was uh, a great example, Derek. And I, and I want to just kind of piggyback on that and say, say the things, say them. Um, they keep promoting me and I do it all the time. In fact, the um, Grand Chief Ron Evans wrote a letter citing my name and Frankie Snyder, or well, at that time, Frankie Scribe says <laughs> to the premier and they still promote me. So, um, you know, when you, when you do it with kindness and you do it with, with integrity and, and sort of your whole self, I find that, that people can be quite forgiving and, and generally, I do feel that most of my colleagues want to do the right thing. They're just stuck on, on the how. And so the biggest barrier for me and, and I, like my colleagues around this table, um, I have a laundry list, like probably 30 pages long of barriers and solutions. Um, but I'll start with the slippery words that we use. And so whole of government, right? What does that mean? How, how does that work? Consultation, engagement, and even reconciliation. Um, we use those words and we use them interchangeably and we don't always have a good sense of what they mean. And then how do we use that within our, within our roles to move forward in a good way? And so we'll throw a whole bunch of things under the label of reconciliation because check it, it involves indigenous people, but does it actually meet any of the TRC recommendations? Does it meet a call to justice? Just because you think it maybe sort of aligns with um, something an indigenous person might have done or said or, or liked doesn't make it reconciliation. And so that's been a, a barrier for me within government. Um, but we need to have the systemic approaches in order to really clarify that. So we right now don't have some of the systemic mechanisms um, within our treasury board, within our cabinet submissions, within, right, if we built reconciliation right into those spaces so that every time something goes before our central government for a decision, that reconciliation lens and an analyst trained in knowing what that means um, is involved in the decision. We'll get there. I think we'll get there. I'm on it, but but we don't have those pieces yet, and so that is a, a real barrier. Resourcing is a huge barrier, and I think any Indigenous employee of our civil service or our public service will agree um, that Indigenous folks within our system um, fail the span of control um, test, and so we tend to be under um paid if i can say that <laughs> we tend to fall in a lower classification and we tend to fall within a different set of classifications because we don't have as many employees and i've had this conversation so i'm not telling tales out of school with our commissioner and with with our the adms responsible for the public service i've had these conversations all over the place um, and i do have a sense that there's a desire to 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 shift that but but span of control versus span of influence so indigenous people are overrepresented in all of our 
really um, expensive, really, uh, I'll, I'll just come out and say it, are really harmful um, services, right? They're, they're the highest, and I shouldn't say the services are harmful. They're, they're, I'm talking criminal justice system, right? At all points of the criminal justice system, indigenous people are overrepresented. But we have one indigenous relations person, and that was a great movement forward within that, within that department. Um, but it takes more than just that one person, right? And it takes more than just the Indigenous uh, Reconciliation and Northern Relations branch of 60 some odd staff who are serving, you know, a whole government and a whole province of Manitobans. So that's, that would be another barrier. The other barrier that I, that I really want to focus on, because when I think of reconciliation, I'm often reminded that, that reconciliation begins with land. Right, we have it that hasn't come up yet today, and I had one of my team members remind me that this week. And the, the spaces that we work in um, are not Indigenous spaces. So my building at 352 Donald is prefabricated walls. I don't even have a window to look outside. There's nowhere for me to safely go and offer tobacco. I we'll go to the Central Park or go somewhere right outside. But there's no smudge capacity within my space. There's, there's, it is not an indigenous um, space. And so when I get asked the question, where are the indigenous employees? Um, that's, that's a huge barrier. Space is a huge barrier. Um, and then there's processes that are unsafe, right? Putting the Indigenous person always as the voice responsible for, right, for holding government accountable. Um, there's a lot of pressure and, and, um, and quite frankly, trauma that comes with that, right? And so those are some of the barriers. But like my colleagues, I think that those are, right, I think, Honestly, I, I can say that I have felt within government. I, I have left government at various times to go back into community and come back. Um, I'm still a practicing therapist. Um, I feel an energy and a commitment within our public service that I haven't felt um, at any other time in my career. And so I, as much as those are barriers, I think that you know, they are also opportunities. And so by speaking voice to them, as, as Darren said, speaking truth to power, um, we, we create the opportunity to do something different. So. So excellent. I'm gonna jump in there, Frankie. I know you had a long list. Um, I'd be interested to see that list for sure. <laughs> uh, Janelle, uh, would you care to share now, please? Sure. So this question invoked a lot of emotion, obviously being frontline um, and seeing the actual struggles that every single man and woman that arrives at Manitou House faces to be reintegrated successfully in their own terms, what that looks like to them. Barriers that they still face that are basic human needs, finding meaningful employment, having the opportunity to even present themselves and explain why they would be a wonderful addition to a company. It, it's mind blowing how ignorant people still are to this day. So, um, you know, education, funding for education, you know, here, here they are, they've, they've gone through generations of trauma and then incarceration where they also weren't adequately supported and they arrive here and we start from the basics, the very basics that they deserve. And they want to better themselves. They want an education, but there's no funding. Um, you know, there's concerns with, you know, arrangements with financial distribution with bands. How am I calling and saying, you know, this, this gentleman wants to apply for this, this program and you have no funds left. Like there's no, like I, it's, and then I have to explain how do I, how do I explain to somebody after all of the wonderful work they've put in that they're not going to be supported? We have to figure out something else. You know, they're, it's heartbreaking. This question is very emotional for me. Like 
when we go into community and we're trying to find, you know, because we try and do legwork to prevent, you know, the rejection that comes. And we try and find um, organizations that are very aware and are willing to help with training and, um, you know, to be culturally appropriate with how they just simply speak and engage with, you know, anybody that's applying that's part of our program. And I remember one of the CEOs who we met with said, well, I'm, I'm doing my part. I'm, you know, we're kind and we're interviewing them and I'm not racist. And I, I, I looked, I, I, I looked around the entire room and I said, you know, I really thought that that was a basic human need is just respect and to be not racist. Like, I didn't think that that was something that we needed, you know, the TRC to come out with, please be kind to one another. Like it, it honestly, it blew my mind. And then I have to turn and, and look, you know, to the people being supported and explain to them that just because you're facing discrimination like this, please don't give up. Please don't think that everybody is like that. You know, because you your your impact here, your your footprint that you're leaving here is so significant. It's so important, and I feel like the day to day, the fight to really ensure that they believe they they believe that people that the community wants to support them, to believe in them, that they are just as valuable as anybody else. Like. I'd like to say that there's an end. Um, and when I go out, I have a brave face on and I like to support everybody, but it's it's hard, it's heart, it's heartbreaking, you know, and you have to to explain to you know the team and my staff to to continue fighting and why we need to continue fighting and why we need to, like everybody has said, to use our voice. You know, I part of me wanted to speak on some of the, the calls to action that are not being met and that are directly um, responsible for the lack of proper and appropriate cultural support in prisons. But I felt like I might not want to open that can of worms. And I just wanted to focus on the, the everyday impact of, you know, of organizations and community members really understanding the wrongdoings and really, really wanting to make that effort to remove barriers and, you know, to work together. You know, we create plans to even have like structured supportive programs for, you know, for employment and education. And we've created programs where we now, we pay volunteer, we pay some staff, we have volunteers to go into the schools to create a, a transition where they can, you know, they really have somebody to support them in the schools. And, and what does that support really look like? And then, well, they're here. And then when they leave here, there's no resources. There's absolutely none. And, um, you know, it's just, I find that we're every day, we're like, yes, come back, please come get your homework done, come here for a meal. Eventually, my boss is going to tell me our budget <laughs> is running out, right? And it's just like, I don't know, it's, I just, it blows my mind that we still don't have basic human needs organized, a strategy for that, right? Education, employment, resources, you know, for, for trauma, like, I'm going to have to send everybody to Frankie and we're going to have to figure out how, you know, to create funding for that. Like it just, this is a very hard question to, to focus on because it's like, I just mm -hmm. want to, <laughs> but yeah, very, the very basics are not being met. And that, that for me are, it's unacceptable, those barriers. Oh, well, thanks Janelle for your compassion. Um, Wow. Um, thank you. Elder McLeod, would you care to share, please? Yeah, I, I work along with Janelle. And she's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wrap it all up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I know the barriers, too, and you talk about the criminal justice system. Um, but whether you're working with Indigenous or non-Indigenous people and trying to make changes, the biggest barrier I find is people's understanding. Mm 
of what reconciliation actually means and trying to understand a sense of how privilege interferes with their ability to uh, see beyond their own view of what the problem is. You know, and I can speak about being on regional councils with Indigenous people and having administration who are supposed to represent Indigenous initiatives and go forward on that portfolio. And yet, when you look at the terms of reference, you see something that you think you're reading right out of the Indian Act in terms of terms of reference and length and how many people and now they're supposed to have in place, depending on how many people are working in institutions and so forth. And I'm not trying to say that people, you know, people who don't understand are somehow bad or deficient in any kind of way. It's just that there's this huge, I guess, sometimes psychological block that comes with this inability to want to go past their implicit bias stage of understanding the issues from a different point, a different way of understanding what true reconciliation means when we have the time to sit on an even playing field with other people. It was already mentioned by a few people, like I'm scared to speak out sometimes because I'm afraid for my job and my work, where, you know, other ones of us have a little bit more uh, power in that regard because, you know, optically for some of the organizations or government entities, it would look bad for them to let go of somebody who's very strong on that portfolio and that issue. You know, uh, so there's a lot going on, but uh, that's the one number one thing for me is sometimes you're like um, swimming on a stream and you're talking to someone who's standing on an island and they don't realize they're standing on an island. You know, they don't realize you're the ones trying to stay upstream and talk with them before you go back down and push that because you're just exhausted. <laughs> you know, uh, that understanding of power and privilege is something that we all have to work on and put those things in place so that if we were to find ourselves in a place of power, that we don't um, use it in a way that uh, creates the same dynamic all over again, just from a different standpoint. I talk a lot about white privilege to people, but at the same time, if we were in a position of the particular issue on power, I could say the very same thing about indigenous privilege. You know, there's lots of things that we have to do, but understanding each other is the biggest one I find. Thank you very much, Elder McLeod. Actually, yeah, the water, when you're referring to the reference, when Janelle was speaking, I was thinking her day must consist of like being like a duck in water. You know, she's quacking on the surface, but underneath she's madly swimming and trying to do so many things. And I'm just so impressed, Janelle, and honored to meet you. Well, actually, all of you. And Wow. Wow. That's impressive. And um, it's tough. It's it's a tough thing. But thank goodness we have all you folks uh, fighting the good fight, as we would say, you know, and then, you know, like we, we talk about, you know, some of the barriers, but I, I know we've had a few little Eurekas, as I mentioned, you know, or little successes. So for you, what what would success look like, either big or small? And and I, I, I'd like to um, lead with Janelle, please. For big successes, I would love to see the call to action regarding Section 84 applications in incarceration. I feel like that application, that that right to have at the very beginning of intake, to have a culturally appropriate and meaningful opportunity for growth while in custody, for, for learning in a way that truly connects them and and starts that healing process at the very beginning I would like to see that implemented more um I don't too frequently we hear there wasn't enough time for intake so they didn't get that application and I'm that's that's not how is that acceptable how yeah, exactly. um I would love to see another call to action for you know, Indigenous community liaison officers who are supposed to be appointed to really bridge that gap from urban cultural centers, what we act as, and, you know, their home communities where they want to go. They don't want to, you know, so many of our, our guys will say, I'm, you know, this is like a jungle of, of cement. Like, I don't, I can't hunt here. I can't fish here. I don't feel good here. And yet here they are. <laughs> they're They're placed here and we need to create that that bridge and that uh, the tools and the skills to get them 
ready so that they're healed so that they can be wonderful members of their community so they can go back and lead good lives that have meaning to them those would be big successes i would love to see more of that more funding for that that was promised i would love to see that actually um, implemented small successes would be more organizations or more companies that are more than willing um, that are happy to just simply provide an opportunity to have anybody apply and you know to give them this you know this opportunity to feel value in themselves to learn new skills um i would love mm -hmm. to see you know more organizations come up with resources right once once everybody leaves, you know, these um, community correctional healing facilities, where what happens afterwards, right? Like we are only so big. And I, like you just said, a duck in water, I run all day. Elder Brian wow. will be a test to that. Like I run all day because there's just, there's, there's not enough. There's absolutely not enough resources. And, you know, we think about addictions. Where are the free addictions programs that are culturally appropriate yeah. in the community? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if there is one or two, two max, what's the waiting list like? And so what do they do in the meantime? That how, am, how do we expect them to have the, an improved quality of life with no support? You know, so more addiction centers, I think would be amazing. It would be amazing and it's needed. Um, yeah, more companies, like Elder Brian said, to be truly aware, aware of what we're doing and um, and then to do their part by acting on it or asking the right questions. Like Frankie said, what does that look like? Okay, if I give this opportunity, will somebody be here to maybe help with the first, you know, semester of work or school? Like, these are all things that can absolutely be done, but, you know, we're constantly being faced with doors being closed on us and rejection letters and, you know, being told, sorry, we just don't do, we don't do that. Or we don't offer, you know, vocational training or support like that when I know that you do. So, you know, and you, you can't respond with negative emails back. So <laughs> it's, um, I don't know. I just, small successes would just really be to see people on the same page and really working towards everybody feeling good about each other, everybody respecting each other. Like, I don't know, these questions are so, how do you, how do you really control your answer? Like I just, I really have to just kind of go from my heart. So yeah. Well, that's what we wanted, Janelle. Thank you so much for being so open and sharing in a good way. Very much Welcome. appreciated. Thank you. I, I'm going to, uh, uh, Frankie looks busy. <laughs> no, I'm teasing Frankie. Uh, do you mind sharing now, Frankie, please? I do not. I was just looking down and listening. Um, so success for me, and this is going to sound so Pollyanna, and I apologize, but it it's true collaborative relationships, right? It is on everything from legislation to financial decisions, like I, I talked about, right? Where we've applied that lens all the way through our system instead of just going here. This is all the things that we check off that, that look like reconciliation or we think might be reconciliation or somehow impacts an Indigenous community, right or wrong. And so we say, yeah, we, we're doing that. Um, and I think, you know, in the in the absence of, of of a good understanding of reconciliation and what it means. Um, this isn't like, this isn't a criticism of people who I, I think are trying to do really good work. This is uh, an invitation for us to, to stretch and to really make sure that something meets um, what indigenous people think is reconciliation, right? Not reinventing what we as civil servants and public servants think. And uh, I tried to add it in the chat when, when Elder Brian was speaking about, you know, there's this checklist going around um, that some of my colleagues were sending about 50 points of privilege in the workplace. And it, it just won't let me add it to the chat, but being aware, you know, even as an indigenous person, um, I, I have a ton of privilege, right? Both from my social location, from, um, 
you know, the paleness of my skin from the, the, you know, number of times that I've been allowed to say something very cheeky that I get away with. I also have points where I don't have privilege. I'm neurodivergent and I ramble and people, you know, don't always have space for my storytelling and right. There's, there's spaces where I don't, but understanding the intersectionality of our experiences as indigenous people and, and pr giving space to those who, who aren't heard. Right. And I, and I've been having this conversation a lot lately, challenging my system to say, you know, why is it that we see so many white passing indigenous people in leadership roles and understanding fully that, that I'm one of those people, right? But how, how do we make sure that we're challenging that and having that conversation? So I think those are things that, you know, when we get to the success point, we will see true representation of the full rainbow of colors that, that are um, the Indigenous experience and, and, and other experiences as well. We'll see reconciled approaches. And I take that completely from a reconciled healing model that I as a therapist practice with in, in my practice, um, where we, we bring in the space for both, um, you know, the, the Western colonial models of healing and traditional healing. And we have the space for both of those to live and intersect with one another injustice we were talking about a reconciled justice model not not simply here's a bunch of resources now go away and do your thing and now we, we there's no way for your system to talk to ours but stretching ourselves to understand what do those two systems look like when they're when they're married right what you know great we have first nations policing but can they actually enforce laws and when they enforce laws is there a court that's able to enforce them is it right? Is there a process? You know, so what are those pieces that we need to embed, not just in justice, but in all of our areas of work that create that reconciled um, approach? And so I've been shifting my language from, from devolution language to reconciled language to really paint that picture for my colleagues so that they understand this isn't just about handing a bunch of resources and then going or arguably insufficient resources <laughs> and then going, all right. And then, and then at the end of the day saying, see, that didn't work. Well, no kidding, it didn't work. It was set up not to work. So that would be um, one area where I would see success. On the big macro scale, we would stop to see over-representation of our people in prison as victims, as missing and murdered women and, and two-spirited people and boys we would stop seeing our people human trafficked, right? We would stop seeing over-representation on income assistance and, and underemployment, right? And we don't want to talk about that all the time because we don't want to talk, you know, we don't want to perpetuate stereotypes, but the system is perpetuating that. And so true reconciliation will see more economic opportunities in the North Right, we've been talking about this for so long. Someone said, "Well, we need a, last week said we need a, opportunities for business and and stuff." And I can't remember what community we were talking about. And I was like, "You know what? Yeah, we just we were talking about that." Like, right? I don't know when I was a baby PM three in government. Um, we just need to do it, right? We'll see that those that needle has moved, and so so yeah, it's again easy to do, easy not to do, right? So I'll let somebody else speak now. I'm going to start to get teary just like, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, thank you, Frankie. Thank you very much. Uh, Derek, I'm, uh, I'm going to move to you, please. Thank you. Yeah, I won't be as moving as everyone else, but it's something simple for me would be that when we're doing something in government, we're working with the Indigenous communities not because we have to or this checkbox has to be checked but because it's part of the system and we do it because it's the right thing to do um that's to me a success is they like we talked about undrifted we talk about all these things that we're trying to set as a benchmark we shouldn't have a benchmark it should just be how we do things we shouldn't be striving to meet the bare minimum we should be going above and beyond and and, and it's not even difficult like i said when we have conversations about certain things it's shouldn't be rocket science to have everyone at the table. 
and that just doesn't happen. And, and the fact that we're trying to say we need this many people at the table, you know, why are we always sending these benchmarks just to achieve? And we seem to just want to achieve that so that we can say we did it. So success, success for me would be just having in, uh, that collaboration as part of business, not because we have to, but because we, it's the right thing to do. And then also, I guess success would be that we don't have to have these, these forums where we're trying to discuss where we go, because I, I think we've all said it, it's been happening for far too long and we seem to be talking about it a lot. It's time to, to, to actually be doing something uh, you know, actions speak louder than words. Great. Uh, thank, oh, thank, thank you, Derek. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. And, and Darren, I will go to you next, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, so a lot of good comments there from the panel. I want to say first, why well, I really enjoyed listening to all that. Um, uh, I guess um, I'll start with um, big. Could you just frame the question a little bit more again, Leona? You're you're on mute there, dear. Yeah, totally <laughs> knew that as soon as I started. Yeah, talking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the uh, the question is, what would success look like, either big yeah. or small? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So. I, you know, when I think about uh, big successes, um, I, I, I think about some of the things that I've done and had had the privilege to participate in a work way in the past. And I, and I feel uh, with some of those things, I thought, I feel like, oh, gosh, man, if they only just would have took it a little bit further and longer and kept supporting it, you know, uh, that would, that would really be, I think, impacting uh, and it would have impacted on a number of the issues that uh, panelists have raised in their uh, uh, in their comments that they provided. Um, so, when I, what would be a really good big sort of territory success for me is to see see the three levels of government and the indigenous communities come together, work together more often, um, and celebrate those successes themselves. Because I think if you do more of that, <clears throat> you're only gonna, you're going to set the tone for the environment that we're trying to create and, and go forward in. And there are some success stories that the three levels of government or maybe one or two levels of government are undertaking with indigenous leadership and communities. Uh, but I don't think we do a good enough job of sort of like uh, fanning that out to the mainstream of what that really means. You know, um, like in my own neighborhood, there's 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 a really significant two developments uh, that are urban uh, reserves and uh, they're they're going to be really, really significant in many ways for not only the indigenous communities that are part of those partnerships, but the community in general. And that's, we need to really, you know, celebrate that success and build on that as well. I, I don't know if it's the time of year we live in, meaning like this is 2022. I just think the three levels of government, they need to do a better job at coming together even if they, you know, as they're doing that in real time, realizing, okay, here's the boundary we can and won't cross, or we want to cross, and we've got to figure out a way how to do that. And if you want to do that in true, you know, like we use this term a lot, uh, spirit of reconciliation, just do it. But do 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 more to celebrate, collaborate, get those get those those um, successes out there. Uh, I. You know, I, I, I really, I, I just, I think it's a really good approach and way to go because it's, like I said, for lack of better way of explaining it, it kind of sets a tone for the bigger sort of, like when you turn on the news or if you talk to your neighbor or if you read a paper or if you, you catch something on social media and it's there and it's, and it's a, being celebrated as a success, well, it's only going to generate 
some kind of level of positivity and uptake. There will be negative response because that is part of our human nature that we're all trying to work through in our big grand journey in the universe. Uh, you know, uh, like um, all these other, um, what I would call our, 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 our shortcomings, I guess, human shortcomings. I don't know uh, what I'm trying to say there. But so that's the big successes I would like to see, you know, and I think about one that I was uh, inferring to earlier that I had the privilege to work on with um, Elder McLeod back in the, I think it was in the 90s, Winnipeg Partnership Agreement. And I think some of those, it was the very first Aboriginal component of the Urban Development Agreement at the time. And Urban Development Agreements had been around since the uh, 70s, maybe even the 60s, where the three levels of government come together. And so that particular Urban Development Agreement between, I think, 1995 and it was a five or 10 year agreement, created the first Aboriginal component where they brought together the three levels of government and all the urban um, indigenous community leadership to discuss and describe and work on what an Aboriginal component would be. Some of those still those programs still exist to this day, but I bet you any money because I'm not personally involved anymore. There's some of them probably still struggling and waiting at the eleventh hour for government or governments to continue that partnership. So, big going back to big success. There's more work there to be done, but you know as I use a lot of quotes, but as David Letterman used to say, gosh darn it, we, you know, we, we should get this done, you know. Um, and small successes, uh, you know, um, I think that's um, on, on a personal level, uh, I, 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 try to, I try to live that in my everyday life um, in the work that I do <clears throat> and even in my everyday living. And um, I'm just so thankful I'm with a group of people in my work life that I feel respected and supported by. Because even though we're all living right now, like I said, under that quote of truth and reconciliation, and we should be looking and finding initiatives and strategies and, and so on and tables to build those, to build things under that banner, it's a, it's a struggle still, it really is, you know? So I try to find my smaller successes through those people I'm supported by and I find ways to support them. And I'm learning still. And uh, when people come to me and if I, you know, they're asking me that sometimes I'm surprised, but then I'm surprised also even further along when I realize, wow, I'm, it's a good thing I said that because I didn't know I could say that and provide what they needed, you know? Um, yeah, so, and, um, hmm, yeah, not enough time, I'm afraid, you know, for this for big and small, um, but, and, and, and to the point, there was someone had raised in this, I think the last round that, um, about these kinds of, um, these um, pa panels. I think um, even if things are resolved better in a better way, we still need things like this so we can keep that communication going, you know, uh, for sure. Uh, we need that. We need that because you can you can go out and and try to find that, but if it's not more broadly known, you're gonna you know you might miss something. So I, I think it's yeah. I, I really I really enjoyed this opportunity. I was a little nervous about. I'll be honest because I thought it was gonna be. I was worried about being triggered today about something, but uh i'm glad i talked with uh, the coordinator who approached me a little bit more and my and my own manager and to my creator i prayed and then when i saw you know elder uh, mcleod's face on here I was like, oh man this is going to be golden <laughs> <laughs> and of course everyone else of course everyone else and, and especially you leona your face is just always a beaming happiness of i just i just love it um yeah so i'll, I'll just i'll end with those comments for now on this particular question Excellent. Thank you so much, Darren. I just want to acknowledge that we are out of time. If everyone can stay great, if you can't, um, I truly understand your commitments. I would like to hear from Elder McLeod on some of the successes he's had, big or small, um, based on the work he does for, with everyone. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, um, I, I, some of the 
biggest successes, I guess, the big successes is seeing this gradual, slow movement of uh, trying to bring us all together into the same statistical, statistical reality of our life, right? So we at least all have a fair shot at what it means to succeed and have self-determination and healing in this, in this, in this um, place that we share. Um, for me, I, I still believe that we're, we can come to a place where I can look at uh, my brother, look to my sister, look to my non-binary relative, and I can look at everybody as, as a part of a big family, big community. And, you know, maybe it's a little controversial to say that, but when sometimes we talk about multiculturalism, I see multiculturalism as, a, uh, as a, an ally towards self-determination, reconciliation, and, and truth, you know, because never, not everyone's in the same equal place in life, and we need to acknowledge that no matter where we are in this movement that we go forward. Um, and being, being, seeing the excitement in people's faces or the possibilities in people's faces when you share education to people. Not, you know, you start with the truth of the beginning of the relationship, coming back to the original treaty relationship and what it, the spirit of that treaty relationship and extending that, of course, to our, our Métis, to the Inuit, to all of us working together in, in the spirit of reconciliation and truth. Um, but I, I do love the excitement on people's faces and the possibilities when you share with them, you know, the success stories, the success stories of other partnerships that have developed, you know, like sometimes when you talk about, say, the, the old Campion barracks there and you compare it to what could happen, like with what's happening in Osseo's Reserve, BC, you know, mm -hmm. and seeing the possibilities that exist to work together and provide a future. I, I we do hoping that we can to continue these conversations, but to work in a place where we come with that, that formula of success. So that, you know, people who maybe have misgivings about what they think about in terms of indigenous rights uh, or moving towards in foreign truth and reconciliation can honestly see that there are benefits for everybody, you know, in, in this walk together. So that if that's the person who's standing on the island, looking at the other one, trying to keep up with them, on that swimming upstream that they can extend their hand and say, I'm not losing anything by bringing, you know, extending my hand to you and helping you into this place where I sit that, that we can all benefit and grow together. You know, this is something that can provide all of us a good way of life, you know. Um, but for me, the most best success, the small success for me is when I used to do a lot of work in the schools. I haven't done that for quite a while. Mm -hmm. It's been part of the journey, mm -hmm. but I have kids who recently uh, finished their work in the school system. But I still remember the little faces of children who identify themselves as Indigenous in their classrooms for the first time because they feel good about saying it. They feel proud about saying it. And that's why I think it's uh, a good teaching for all of us to want to, uh, to, want to hold on to and share with each other so that's that's all i have to say miigwech thank you oh thank you thank you all so much uh, um yeah i know eh? the the youth they eh? they'll tell us everything won't they <laughs> um i would really like to thank all the panelists darren Derek, janelle frankie and and brian for joining us and offering those words are there um i i understand the time we're out of time so